booktv.org. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bookstore Talk. Today, I'm Jeff Hoffman, and I'm your host for this hour. Today, we're going to be talking about the New York Historical Society. I'm Dale Gregory. Vice President for Public Programs, and it's always a thrill to welcome you to our spectacular Robert H. Smith Auditorium. Tonight's program, Stalin Waiting for Hitler, 1921, 1929 through 1941, is part of the Bernard and Irene Schwartz Distinguished Speaker Series, which is the heart of our public programs. And we always want to thank Mr. Schwartz for all his support, which has enabled us to invite so many prominent authors. I'd also like to recognize and thank New York Historical Trustee, Chairman Emeritus, Roger Hertog, who is responsible for the 2011 renovation of New York Historical Society's building, as well as this magnificent Robert H. Smith Auditorium during his tenure as chairman, let's give him a big hand. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to recognize and thank trustees Barry Barnett, Joel Pickett, Cy Sternberg, Ira Unschuld, and all the wonderful Chairman's Council members with us for their great work and support as well. Thank you. <clears throat> So the program tonight will last an hour, include a question and answer session, and the Q&A will be conducted via written questions on cards. You should have received a card and a pencil. If you haven't, the staff are circulating right now to hand more out, and they will be collected later on in the program. There will be a formal book signing in our NY History store on the 77th Street side of our building, and copies of, of Professor Kotkin's books will be available for sale. We are thrilled to welcome Stephen Kotkin back to New York Historical Society. He is a professor holding joint appointments in the History Department and the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. He is also a fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. The author of several critically acclaimed books, his latest, Stalin, Waiting for Hitler, 1929 to 1941, the second of three planned volumes on the life and times of the Soviet dictator. Before we begin, I'd like to ask that you please turn off your cell phones, electronic devices, and now please join me in welcoming Stephen Kotkin. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, there's a little uh, Madeleine Albright uh, stool here for standing up to speak at the podium. That's what they called it in the State Department, the Madeleine Albright uh, stool. But I'm not going to use the podium if that's OK. I normally walk around the room. In fact, I walk all the way around so that I can check the sales and J. Crew. As I'm speaking, yes, got to check out how much those sweatpants cost during the lecture, because of course the university is only $65,000 a year, and you can't check the sales on J. Crew when it's not the lecture. You have to check during. But I see no one has their laptop open right now. So this seems to be a more engaged audience than I'm used to. <laughs> Let's see how this is going to go. So there's this guy, and he's on his deathbed. He's got maybe hours to live, if that. And he's very agitated. He's got to get something off his chest. His wife is by the bedside in the hospital. And he's trying, he's trying, finally he, sees, he does it. And he says to her, I got to tell you something. I cheated on you. And the wife looks at him, and she says, duh, why do you think I poisoned you? <laughs> and uh, her name is Melania.
Do we have time for questions? <laughs> Little did I know, Dale, that a, a biography of Stalin, which I began many years ago, was going to become a self-help book <laughs> uh, when it was published. But here we are. So this is not the Trump lecture. I also do a Trump lecture. Uh, maybe I'll be invited back for that. We'll see. I don't know. Uh, this is the Stalin lecture. So Stalin waiting for Hitler opens in 1929. And the year before, he has announced in a small group, he's blurted out, that he's going to collectivize agriculture by force. Now, there's something called the peasant commune, not in the entire Eurasia, but in the Russian parts, for example, not in Ukraine, not in the Baltics. And the commune collectively redistributes land uh, after a death in the family or a birth in the family or a calamity so that those who have less land and need more can get a little bit more and those who are fine can give up a little bit of land. But after the land is redistributed, it's worked individually, individual household farms. So the commune is not collectively working the land. This is what collectivization of agriculture entails. And the reason he's done this, the reason Stalin has decided to do this in 1928, and now he's going to impose it in 1929, is because he's a communist. Now, I know that sounds hard to believe, but the key secret of the Communist Party archives the ones that were classified and hidden and they wouldn't talk about them and they wouldn't let you see them. The key secret of those archives is that when you get to see the communists behind closed doors, it turns out that they are communists. <laughs> Instead of saying, oh, you know, all that nonsense, the working class, imperialism, the bourgeoisie, we can relax now. Nobody's watching. We can talk about what we really care about. Instead... When they're behind closed doors, nobody's watching. They don't think anybody's going to find out. All they talk about, working class, bourgeoisie, imperialism. And Stalin's argument is as follows. He says, well, we have socialism in the, in the cities, state-owned, state-managed economy, so-called planned economy or five-year plan. But in the countryside, the peasants have had their own revolution in 1917, 1918. They've evicted the gentry class from the land. That is to say, they got rid of the landowners, and they themselves become the de facto landowners, about 25 million peasant households. And this is all through the 1920s. And the peasants are, some of them are quite hardworking. So one day they have two cows, they work hard, they get a third cow, they continue to work, they get a fourth cow. They may, in fact, hire other villagers to work for them because their farms are successful. Well, this is capitalism. This is hired labor, otherwise known as wage slavery, as Marx called it. And Stalin calls this, in the jargon of the time, kulak farms. Kulak means it's slang, it means fist. It means these people kind of holding the others in their fist. It's a derogatory term. And so they're dependent, the regime is dependent on the size of the harvest. They need more grain, but as the peasants are successful, they're a threat to the regime because they are, quote, kulaks or better off farmers. So this is the paradox the regime has implanted itself in the cities and in the countryside there's de facto private ownership of the land, a quasi-market economy, and there are some peasants, not that many, who are doing well. And in fact, because they're doing well, the people in the cities are eating. But Stalin says we can't have two systems, socialism in the city and capitalism in the countryside. Because a Marxist believes that the social base, the social relations of production, determines the political system over the long haul. So capitalism in the countryside, where the vast majority of people live, about 120 million of the 140 or 150 million people live in the countryside, capitalism there means that the regime over the long term is not viable. It will be undone by this new rural bourgeoisie that's forming. And so Stalin argues this, and he says, 
we're going to now collectivize agriculture. And the other people in the regime, they're no friends of peasants. They don't like markets. They're not happy with capitalism in the countryside. They are committed to eradicating capitalism to get to socialism and then eventually to get to communism, right? There are stages of history according to Marx. So the Communist Party has to create socialism and eventually communism. They say, you know, we don't like the peasants either, but how are you going to do this? 1% of the arable land in all of the Soviet Union as of 1928 has been voluntarily collectivized, 1%. So voluntary collectivization, you're going to wait a long time to see that happen. Moreover, those people who voluntarily collectivize their farms are the ones who can't make it in the private, in the individual household farms. So the only way to do it is by force, massive application of force, coercive wholesale collective. So this is what Stalin is going to do now. The other members of the inner circle and the wider part of the regime, the second echelon, the third echelon, they say, this is crazy. You can't really do this. Where are we going to get all that force from? Who's going to actually do all that? And don't you think it would be catastrophic? We'll lose the harvest. We won't increase the harvest. And Stalin says, well, we need mechanization, right? Yes. We need agronomy and fertilizer and consolidation of farms to get scale, just like happening in America. And they all agree with this. Well, Stalin says our little tiny household farms are not going to get us that. We need the kind of consolidation, big collectivization, get to scale, industrialized agriculture, kind of agro-business. And they say, uh, we, we can still do that with the model we have. Please don't try to impose this thing by force. Remember, they're communists too. And Stalin says, well, you don't have the courage of your convictions. Either you believe in socialism and then communism, or you don't. Either we're going to eradicate capitalism in the countryside, or we're going to surrender to these people. Well, you might think, why don't they just allow the successful peasants to continue to grow their farms, acquire more cows, and to build a larger scale agriculture through their hard work. Once again, the answer is that's capitalism. You can't have that. That's what they did in America. We're a socialist country run by a communist party. So of course, uh, Stalin uh, is undeterred, tremendous willpower, maneuverability, shrewdness, and he outmaneuvers them all and forces this mass wholesale coercive collectivization across Eurasia, affecting 120 million people. It's just breathtaking that he's able to do this. What he does is he stirs up, he incites class warfare in the villages. He pits one group of peasants against the other. He imposes quotas for the number of rich peasants who have to be expropriated and shot or deported. So if this were a village, there are 400 people here, he would say, 10% of you, 40 of you, are better off peasants and have to be uh, deported to the wastes of Siberia. And the rest of you are going to join the collectives. And it turns out that not 40 of you, but only 10 of you are actually better off. That is to say, you have three or four or five cows. And the rest of you aren't well off. But if you say this is a crazy idea, that's it. You're now a better off peasant or you're in cahoots, objectively in cahoots with the better off peasants. So the quotas which have to be met, the peasants get together and they begin to protect themselves by saying, no, no, it's not me, it's you. Oh, no, no, not me, it's you. And they point the fingers at each other. <clears throat> This process, this stirring of hatreds and grievances, for example, somebody looked at someone else's wife a few years ago, and the peasant remembers that, and that petty grievance becomes the impetus for now pointing out who's an enemy, who's a, a kulak or a kulak henchman, or objectively in cahoots with the international bourgeoisie. So Stalin stirs up this process it's a process of hatred and jealousy and revenge 
and violence. And it turns out his critics are right. The critics who said it's dangerous if we do this, you're going to destabilize the situation, the harvest is going to be worse, not better, they actually proved to be correct. Moreover, they're correct well beyond what they even predicted. And at this so process launched in 1929, there's a lucky harvest the first year in 1930, and then there's a drought followed by torrential rains in 1931, the dislocation, the peasant resistance, the deportations, deporting the people who can work, right? They're getting rid of the, the better off peasants as well as others getting caught up in the process. And there's a catastrophic famine, 1931 to 33. About five to seven million people starve to death and 50 million to 70 million people starve but survive. Right? A famine is not just about those who perish, but also those who are malnourished, the children who are malnourished, and this is a legacy that lasts a really long time. So it's a horrendous episode, and the famine lasts, is, persists 1932, 1933. There's even a bit of famine in 1934 in some places, although by 1934 the harvest is better. The surviving peasants plant the grain in the collectives and harvest the grain, and so they actually save Stalin's regime, the peasants who have been enslaved and forced into these collectives across Eurasia. So this episode, why is it important? It's important because Stalin doesn't flinch. He doesn't say, oh, you know, you guys were right. I did destabilize the situation. I shouldn't have done this. Let's go back. Let's retreat. He continues to press forward all the way through the famine, using some of the famine and dislocation in order to finish the job of collectivization. And by 1934, he has eradicated capitalism in the countryside. And now he's being celebrated, even by his critics, for having done what nobody thought could be done, which was to impose collective farms across this gigantic one-sixth of the earth, the social engineering. And so this episode, what happens sometimes with ideas, right? Ideas can be noble or ignoble. The methods can be noble or ignoble in implementing the ideas. What happens sometimes with ideas is ideas that are noble, we get that, and we allow for that, and we celebrate that, but when somebody is an idealist or has ideas and the ideas are monstrous or the implementation, the means are monstrous, we tend instead to talk about opportunism, lust for power, and all sorts of other attributes, which of course are present, but we tend not to give as much weight to the ideas when the ideas themselves are anathema. But this episode and many other episodes in the book, in my view, indicate that there's an idealist here, a communist idealist, a communist true believer. Yes, he's an opportunist. Yes, he's bending this way and that way and tactically flexible the way Lenin taught him. Yes, he's trying to grandize, gain even more power, although he's already got a dictatorship within the dictatorship. But he's doing this because he believes this is necessary for the regime to survive, for socialism to be built, and for social justice to be achieved, the elimination of capitalism. He firmly, deeply believes this. The documents are very, very numerous about his beliefs or his uh, discussions of his motivations during this and other processes. And so we need to take seriously sometimes, even when the person is not to our liking, even when the ideas are not to our liking. Just as there's a lot of opportunism with noble ideas, there is, of course, idealism with monstrous ideas as well. Anyway, so this opens the book. Stalin presses this collectivization forward. They get nearly 100% collectivization. They force the nomads in Kazakhstan off the herding 
the grazing lands into collective farms, which they end up losing most of their livestock, and the famine in Kazakhstan is by far the worst. The costs here are astronomical, but for Stalin, he's an instrument of the movement of history, and this is all justified and necessary. But what happens is, during the process, he was being criticized. First, they doubted him when it started, and then when he destabilized everything, the famine broke out, the disease uh, accompanying the famine. It was really horrible. The officials began whispering behind his back and sometimes not behind his back even, criticizing what he had done. Well, this roiled him to no end. It made him so angry that he was doing the hard thing that they said couldn't be done but needed to be done. They agreed that capitalism in the countryside had to be eliminated, but they were too afraid to try or incapable of trying. And he wasn't afraid. He did it. And they had the temerity, the gall to criticize him. This deeply got under his skin. And we see this anger and resentment over the criticism of collectivization coming back again and again and again through further episodes in the regime, including when he murders large numbers of loyal elites, which will happen in the period 1936 to 38, and is also covered in the book. So the argument of the book is that it's not a personality that's formed in youth and then unleashed on the world. It is the experience of acquiring power and exercising power life and death power over hundreds of millions of people, right? That experience is what forms the Stalin whom we know. In other words, it's the rule. It's the experience of rule. It's running, building and running that dictatorship and collectivizing agriculture, imposing that communist system on this vast population. This experience... We all talk about how power, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's a famous saying, right? <coughs> well, power like that, absolute power, also shapes, forms personalities. Whatever was there, whatever demonic, internal, roiling sentiments were there before, they were magnified deeply by this experience of rule. I could give many examples of this process at work. Now, this is uh, a long book, I've been told. It's 900 pages of text. My wife is kind enough to say that it reads like no more than 700. <laughs> she, she said this about volume one also, that the pages just fly by. So a book that big, it's very difficult to give a 30 or a 40 minute condensation of it, but I want to take another episode, a second episode, if that's okay, besides the collectivization episode, to illuminate the kinds of things that you would find in the book. I think I'm actually okay with time for a change. Yes, okay. So the second episode I'd like to talk about is the infamous Hitler-Stalin Pact, the Hitler-Stalin Pact. This is a book that has culture, domestic politics, the economy, foreign policy, all in the same cover, between two covers. Sometimes with Stalin, we get the culture in one book, because the cultural specialist will take that on. We'll get the foreign policy in a separate book. Right? The trick with Stalin is to put everything that he ran, created, experienced, destroyed, right, between the two covers, to bring together what it was like to be Stalin not to separate, to compartmentalize. And the other thing is the geography. There are whole days of Stalin's life that I now know what he did from sort of waking up until going to bed. And what passed his desk that day and what markings he put on the documents. He's a human being. For example, he likes colored pencils. He likes green, red, and blue colored pencils. So the documents in the archives 
are full of his scribblings and scrawlings in these colored pencils. They're produced by the Sacco and Vanzetti factory. <laughs> yes, the colored pencils. He smokes a pipe, as you know. And he puts tobacco inside the pipe from cigarettes. This Herzegovina Flor brand cigarette is his favorite. He unrolls the cigarette, takes the cigarette, and dumps the tobacco into the pipe, two cigarettes worth. If he spills any tobacco on the table or on the floor, he scoops it up because he's a little bit of a neat freak. You know when you go to an overpriced restaurant and they have that white piece of paper on the table, on top of the tablecloth, and then after you're done eating the bread, they come with that letter opener type thing and they take the breadcrumbs and they take them away? That's what he did with the tobacco. If there was a hallway and there was a runner, a carpet down the hallway, he walked on the runner. And if somebody else that he saw was not on the runner, he would shout out, hey, get on the carpet. He played, he bowled. He loved a form of bowling, Russian form of bowling called garadki, lawn bowling. He loved the Russian bathhouses. He loved to read. He read books all the time, hundreds of pages of books. Later on, as he's murdering everybody, he begins to read about Roman despotism. He thinks there are lessons in there for him as a despot in the Roman story, reading up about Augustus and various other figures. So there's a person in there, and it's hard to get in that, inside that person. It's hard to get in there, but evil is much more interesting uh, when it's human. So here we have the Hitler-Stalin pact, this infamous thing in August 1939. And one of the wives' tales, there's just an amazing number of uh, false stories about Stalin that are passed on from generation to generation. And then you go look to see what the document base, you know, where is this substantiated, and often it's not. But anyway, one of the wives' tales is that he trusted nobody. He was a very suspicious person, but somehow he trusted Hitler. Right. I don't know. On the surface of it, it's kind of absurd. So my working hypothesis was, let's, let's assume he didn't trust Hitler, potentially, and let's see what comes out. And so just before he's... he's now, remember, you've, there's the Munich Pact in 1938 when uh, Chamberlain and Daladier, Britain and France, hand Hitler a piece of Czechoslovakia with no compensation. Right? There are these episodes before the Hitler-Stalin Pact. But now we are in August 1939. All during the Hitler-Stalin pact negotiations, Stalin is at war with Japan. But that's East Asian studies, and so those are usually in different books from the Hitler-Stalin pact, which is European studies. And once again, the compartmentalization problem. Anyway, so he's at war against a very substantial army, the Japanese army, in, uh, in, on the borderlands of Mongolia, Manchukuo, there's the Japanese have conquered Manchuria, created a puppet state, Manchukuo, in the earlier part of the 30s. So that's happening. And now he's negotiating with Hitler. So he's, Stalin's a reader. He reads up. They have a translation of Mein Kampf, internally produced for the regime. Stalin has an aide take care of this, delivers the Mein Kampf translation. So Stalin's got Mein Kampf, and he's underlining with those colored pencils He's underlined. For example, it says, Untermenschen, subhumans. He underlines that. It says, Drang nach Osten, right? Drive to the east. He underlines that. So you start to get the impression that, you know, he got something out of Mein Kampf. <laughs> right? He kind of, he, he got the point, what that book is about. And then you see that he read other things. He read a biography of Hitler by Conrad Haydn in Russian translation. The main argument of which is, you know, Hitler n never keeps any of his agreements. He's a liar. Never keeps his agreements. So here Stalin is in negotiations with him. Yeah, check mark, Hitler never keeps his agreements. So you begin to see that he wasn't that trusting of Hitler. In fact, Hitler understood that Stalin didn't trust him, as he told his, Hitler told his own minions. So anyway, so the, the invite, Hitler's the one who needs the deal because he's decided to attack Poland, and Britain and France have avowed publicly to defend Poland. 
And so if the Soviet Union joins Britain and France, Germany is potentially surrounded and has a two-front war to fight over the Poland thing. So Hitler's concerned to get his eastern flank right, stabilized with a non-aggression pact with Stalin. So Stalin has a lot of leverage in the negotiations. Now, he hasn't told a lot of people that these negotiations are going on because he's suspicious and a conspirator. And at the Dacha, the night before Ribbentrop is supposed to, Ribbentrop is Hitler's foreign minister on behalf of the Fuhrer coming to Moscow to do the deal. The night before, they're, they're at Stalin's Dacha, and uh, Stalin says to this, this guy, Nikita Khrushchev, who's kind of a little protege of Stalin at this point, and he says to him, yeah, you know, Ribbentrop is flying in tomorrow night. And Stalin has this preferred sense of humor that everyone in the regime is familiar with. For example, Stalin won't see somebody for a long time, then he'll see them, and he says, what, you haven't been arrested yet? <laughs> yeah, right, that's his sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, how do we like to work in that regime? <laughs> anyway, so Khrushchev, yuck, 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 Ribbentrop is flying to Moscow, right? It's the Nazis, the communists, they hate each other, nothing but pouring filth over each other in, in their propaganda. And Khrushchev doesn't know what to say, so he takes it as a joke. Yeah, 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 he's going to join. He's going to join the Communist Party, right? Anyway, Stalin says, no, no, actually, he's, Ribbentrop is flying to Moscow tomorrow. And Khrushchev is a little flummoxed. Anyway, to get towards the end of this story, uh, Stalin hasn't told very many people. He's just told Khrushchev the night before at this little gathering, the dinner, supper, really, at the dacha. He hasn't told the border guards. So Ribbentrop is flying on Hitler's personal plane, a condor, across from uh, Königsberg, which is today Kaliningrad, right, into Soviet territory, and the Soviet border guards don't know. It's an unidentified plane. It's a German plane. And they begin to shoot the anti-aircraft guns. And they miss. They miss Ribbentrop's plane, and so he continues on and lands safely in Moscow. Can you imagine Stalin telling Hitler... Had the, had the anti-aircraft not missed. You know, it was a misunderstanding. <laughs> we invited your foreign minister here to Moscow, and, and we, didn't, we forgot to tell the border guards, and they shot him down. I'm so sorry. It won't happen again. <laughs> you can only imagine how history would have come out had they not missed, how they hit that plane. Instead, the plane, as I said, lands safely. Ribbentrop is received at the, uh, at the airport with Stalin's uh, personal armored Packard. And there's a picture of this in the book, just like there's a picture of Hitler's plane with Ribbentrop on it, which comes from Ribbentrop's personal photo album. There's a picture also, a photograph also in the book, of a Stalin's armored Packard with the Nazi flag on it, sent to pick up Ribbentrop, which is from the private newsreel of the landing that was made for Stalin personally. It's a little snippet out of the newsreel. Anyway, Ribbentrop goes to the Kremlin, they begin to negotiate, they cut the deal. The deal is about Hitler, gets most of Poland, Stalin gets a piece of other side of Poland, Poland's going to disappear, there's going to be these spheres of influence beyond Poland. Okay, deal is done, the map is arranged, they agree on where the line goes down in Poland. Ribbentrop goes back to Hitler, Hitler is overjoyed, and the Nazis invade Poland, September 1st, 1939, about a week after Ribbentrop has been in Moscow. And Stalin is supposed to invade Poland from the other side, but he doesn't do anything. He's just watching. Poland has an army. Poland has an air force. Maybe they're going to bog the Germans down. Well, it turns out that the Poles fight heroically, but they don't bog the Germans down. The Nazis, the Blitzkrieg type operation, it's not called that yet, uh, slices through Poland. And lo and behold, already September 16, 17, 18, right? Uh, the German forces are on Stalin's side of the line. So think about this. There's a a map, they agree, and Stalin's got what with Hitler? He's got this piece of paper that Ribbentrop has signed on behalf of Hitler, and then the German army is moving eastward in Stalin's direction, and now they're on the other side of the line that was agreed. 
So, uh, so he sends a minion in Berlin to meet with the head of German intelligence. You know, what's going on here? The minion gets into the office. There's a giant map on the table. And the map shows the German forces, where they are, with the little stick pins, you know, on the military map. And it, the map shows that they're on Stalin's side of the line. And this is reported back to Stalin that they're mapping this, you know, in sort of German headquarters. So Stalin calls in the German military attaché, who's stationed in Moscow, and he says to him, you guys, you're on my side of the line. And the guy said, well, you know, it's just a misunderstanding. You, we'll fix this. Don't worry. He says, well, you know, we're killing the Poles, and the Poles are running. They're running away. And so in order to chase them and wipe them out, we had to go farther than we thought we were going to go. And it just so happens that the side of the line where the Germans are that was supposed to be Stalin's, that's where the oil fields are. The Galician oil fields around the city of Lvov, Lviv, Lvov, Lemberg. Know that city? Yeah. Anyway, and so just a coincidence, they're on the other side, they're on Stalin's side of the line and the oil fields are there. So Stalin says to the German military attaché, uh, well, if it's a misunderstanding, fine, but we're going to take that territory back. And the Red Army goes in, forcibly seizing back the oil fields. September 19th, 20th, 1939. The Red Army and the Wehrmacht engage in skirmishes, and there are casualties on both sides. So that's your Hitler-Stalin pact. Right? Stalin forcibly takes... Remember, there are casualties on both sides here. This is real engagement. He forcibly retakes those oil fields that are on his side of the map. During the middle of all this, Hitler himself is in Poland. He's in Zopot, or Sopot, which is a coastal resort near Gdansk on the Baltic Sea. And Hitler gives the order in the middle of it, while Stalin is forcing the Germans backward, he gives the order to retreat. He says, we shouldn't be there, get out of there. And as the Germans are retreating, they're very angry. They need that oil. They earned it. They took it. And so they fire at the Soviets as they're retreating, the Germans do. Stalin draws the conclusion that the German army wants war with the Soviet Union, and Hitler is the restraining force. Exactly the opposite of what the facts were. So this is a gigantically important episode. Now, you're going to say, what happened to the oil? Well, of course, Stalin is selling. There's a trade or economic dimension to the pact. And Stalin is selling the German army grain and oil in exchange for German military, or German weapons, German military industry. So Stalin is selling the Germans the oil that the Germans had seized themselves in exchange for state-of-the-art German uh, armaments. So you can only imagine how happy that makes the Germans feel. Right? The oil that they took, they're now paying for. They had to give it back up, and they're now paying for So there are quite a lot of episodes like this that need to, you need to get a fresh look at, and you need to put yourself into Stalin's mindset for understanding you know, what the world looked like from his point of view, not because we have to validate his point of view. I have very little sympathy with the values or the practices of Stalin's regime. I would say zero sympathy. But in order to understand how this regime operated, right, what type of person he was, rather than insert our assumptions or impose our assumptions on his way of thinking. So he's got the Japanese army moving in his direction in the east. He's got the German army moving in his direction in the West, and then now they're on the other side of that line that he's agreed, and all he's got is a slip of paper, and he's been writing check marks about Hitler never keeps agreements right, before they did the pact. So you have to say to yourself, it could be that Stalin didn't trust Hitler. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Maybe we'll take some questions now. Okay, here we go. These are your questions. And as you can see, I'm taking the top one. 
You know how dealers are, right? And then nothing up the sleeve. No questions that I wrote myself. You trusting me? You want to sign a pact? <laughs> All right, here we go. During the famine and post-famine, did the worldwide financial depression affect Russia? Excellent question. So one of the things about communism was that the timing was good. You see, the capitalism is the reason you have socialism. Because capitalism is no good, and socialism is going to be better. Capitalism is in Great Depression. It has mass unemployment. It's got fascist militarism. It's got imperialism or colonies all over the world. So in the 1930s, against that background, socialism has full employment. It has got a stated peace policy rather than an aggression, fascist aggression. It's got self-determination rather than colonialism or imperialism. So in the 1930s, despite the famine, despite the 5 to 7 million deaths and the 50 million to 70 million starved and survived, despite that, many people around the world, not just in the Soviet Union, are looking at this and saying this, this is better or this could work. What happens after World War II is the Soviet Union again assumes that capitalism will have another Great Depression. In fact, this is the basis, the core of Stalin's grand strategy, that Great Depression, boom and bust, is inherent in the capitalist system. The problem for Stalin is that capitalism forgot to have another Great Depression after World War II. Instead, it had a middle-class economic boom. And my father, who worked in an embroidery factory, bought a house in the post-World War II economic boom. Right? Japan, West Germany, just a tremendous story. And so against that background, socialism doesn't look as good. And this is the problem for socialism. The problem for socialism is it's only necessary if capitalism isn't working, socialism is going to be better. So if capitalism is working better and better, and there's no reason for socialism anymore. So that's, that dynamic is the reverse in the 1930s during the famine. And so many people, unfortunately, excuse the famine precisely because they see capitalism is horrific, Mass unemployment, fascist aggression, imperialism. And socialism has to be better than that, even if it's got some growing pains. Okay. Do you see parallels between Stalin and Trump or Stalin and Steve Bannon? <laughs> so it took until the second card. <laughs> so let's give the audience credit and ask the legitimate question for the first question. And here we are now with Stalin and Trump. Yeah, so let's say a few things about Stalin. Uh, 16 to 20 million people died as a result of Stalin's policy. I don't know where you are with Trump, but I don't think we're there yet with that kind of stuff. Right? Stalin was diligent. He worked all day, 16, 18-hour days showed up at the office all day, convened meetings with officials. There was an interagency process. There was a policy process. Yes, Stalin was also the guy we know. He was a sociopath. Yes, but he built a military-industrial superpower. There's no question he presided over that and had quite a lot to do with that. There are very few people in Stalin's category. Hitler, maybe, Mao, and who else? A handful of mother-in-laws? <laughs> That's really it. I don't think Trump is in that category for everything that we can say about Trump. Plus, God willing, right, in 2024, we'll be done with Trump. <laughs> Yeah, hello, New York. <laughs> right? One point, what, seven million 
uh, Hillary Clinton won New York by, including New York City, 1.5 million votes. And she won California by 4.2 million. So in other words, Trump won the United States of America by 3 million votes, excluding California and New York. That's something to remember also. And if we run up the score again, and the Democrat in the next election wins New York not by 1.7 million, but by 3.7 million, guess what? Same score. Same score. Because it's not about New York and California. Okay. What do you consider the most common misapprehensions of the Spanish Civil War? I see we got history buffs in the audience keeping me on my toes. <laughs> Another very good question. Uh, the Spanish Civil War, as you know, is this episode 1936 to 1939. There's a Spanish Republic. There's an attempted putsch by generals, one of whom is Francisco Franco, who's this little pipsqueak. Uh, and he's not the only one. There's this guy, General Mola, uh, with Franco, a couple of others, uh, elderly, General San Giorgio, who's in exile in Portugal, uh, goes back to Spain with the putsch, uh, but uh, is such a dandy, has so much luggage that his plane crashes. <laughs> and he never makes it to the putsch. Anyway, the reason there's a putsch is because uh, they don't like the republic, they don't like democracy, they don't like the anti-clericalism of the left, and they're afraid of uh, leftism, which they consider equivalent to the Bolsheviks or socialism. Right? The putsch, however, is not supported by the entire country, there's resistance to the putsch, as a result of which the Spain descends into civil war. Stalin intervenes in the civil war on behalf of the republic to help it defend itself against Franco and Franco's um, helpmates inside Spain and outside Spain like Mussolini and Hitler. And this becomes a kind of big moral struggle between uh, fascism and anti-fascism or between Franco and his putschists and the left. The left is made up of many, many different groups, from anarchists to communists to splinter communists to democratic socialists. And they're in what's called a popular front, a popular front on the left or no enemies to the left. So the main misapprehension of the Spanish Civil War, uh, by the way, just a few years ago, we finally got the secret documents on Stalin's intervention in the Civil War. So we have a new story now that we didn't have before, which is detailed in one of the longer chapters in the book. But the main misapprehension is that the popular front in Spain, the leftist coalition to oppose the putsch in the civil war against Franco, that that leftist popular front failed because Stalin was evil and began to conduct purges, arrests, and assassinations on the left dividing the left, as a result of which it was weakened, Stalin didn't want a leftist revolution, or he wanted only a communist version of it, and it was weakened, and therefore Franco won. This is a story that is uh, heroically told in many great memoirs. George Orwell has an absolutely brilliant book, which takes a version of this line, and Orwell himself was a participant, as you know, and was wounded in, in, in the Spanish Civil War. Hemingway was there. It's a very heavily romanticized episode. So the facts are the following. The popular front on the left failed on its own terms because the socialists and the communists in Spain hated each other. There was such a gulf between the socialists and the communists. The communists didn't want to cooperate with the socialists because the communists didn't believe the socialists were for real. They thought that they were actually apologists for capitalism, that they were going to keep markets and private property, not go all the way, the way Lenin, Stalin, and the communists would go. And the socialists suspected that the communists were not being truthful when they said they were in coalition for the socialist parliamentary regime with private property, that the communists were actually working behind the scenes to undermine this. So the socialists distrusted the communists, the communists distrusted the socialists. 
And so you see this warfare on the left, a civil war inside the Spanish Civil War on the left, which cripples the left's ability to fight even before Stalin's skullduggery is then added to the mix. And in fact, it's Stalin who's restraining the communists to force them into this coalition, Popular Front of the Left, and he's the one who's trying to make the Popular Front work, even as he's assassinating individuals. Now, Franco wins the war because there's a Popular Front on the right, which is successful. In other words, the right is a bunch of groups also disparate, monarchists all the way to fascists, traditionalist Catholics, right? Big mix on the right. And Franco is able to marginalize the Spanish fascists, who are quite small in number, and to build this popular front on the right domestically. And in fact, that's one of the main reasons he wins the Civil War. And so Franco wins through political means. He's dexterous politically. And the left is condemned by its own civil war inside itself between those who accept parliaments, private property, and markets, and want a kind of welfare state version of socialism versus those who are more Leninist, Stalinist version. Anyway, I could give you many more details. But then again, it's in the book. (laughs) For those people who are thinking that the holidays are coming, and the Spanish Civil War is just the thing you want to give as a gift (laughs) to dad or grandpa or your children who who ceased reading after they turned five and discovered your phone. All right. I got another one. This was inserted onto the top, but not by me. So my conscience is still mostly clear at this point. What was Stalin like in his interpersonal relationships with women? Was he a Harvey Weinstein type or not? I added that part. So what was he like with the women? That's here. The other part is ripped from the headlines. (laughs) You get punchy. I don't know about you, but I commute out to Princeton on a thing that we can continually... Still, to this day, we're calling it a train. Uh, But if you've ever been on it, it does not merit that name. It makes all local stops, including those stops which aren't on the schedule. And just sits there in the middle of New Jersey doing nothing with no announcement. Or if there's an announcement, it's... And that's my life now. Yep. It's called New Jersey Transit. Right. Has anybody ever been on that thing? It makes the LIRR and Metro North look like the Japanese bullet train. (laughs) So I was on that on the 638 out of Penn Station this morning to go out there and check those J. Crew sales. (laughs) And here I am now. I think it's nighttime in New York. All right, let's do the women thing. So there's a lot of stuff in the book about Stalin's interpersonal relations. He didn't have a harem. Most dictators have a harem. If you know your Mussolini, you know that there are mistresses and then there are others besides the mistresses, concubines, whatever. And it's pretty typical that they do this. Sometimes it's extremely coercive. Beria, for example, had a harem. And a lot of it was coerced. Women were pulled in off the street by some of Beria's henchmen, it looks like. We don't know for sure because some of the documents have vanished. Anyway, so Stalin has no harem. He doesn't have very many mistresses either. It's very hard to identify mistresses. That is to say, in documentation, to substantiate them. There are some rumors And there are some memoirs about how I was Stalin's mistress. And you know what that's good for, right, those memoirs. Many years after he's dead, Valentina Istomina worked uh, at the dacha where Stalin lived. And people think that after Stalin's 
wife uh, committed suicide in November 1932, that Stalin had a lifelong affair with Valentina Istomina, beginning not long after. So you get in, you check the documentation, Istomina began working at the dacha in 1946. <laughs> so that tells you what that old wife's tale is worth. So he had a wife who died young, his first wife, from disease in Baku. In, he married in 1907, she died in 1908. Uh, he seems to have loved her. There's a photograph in my first volume taken from the uh, Georgian archives of uh, her funeral. He then remarried. Uh, he was uh, so very much older than his second wife, Nadia, Nadezhda, and she was a teenager. Uh, when he married a second wife, and he loved her. There's no question he loved her, uh, but he was not a very good uh, husband. He neglected her the same way he neglected his two children. He had one child from his first wife, Yaakov, who was a Georgian, uh, the first wife, and then he had two children, uh, Svetlana and Vasily, from the second wife, Nadia, who, as I said, committed suicide in 1932. In his own way, he loved her. He was very difficult. Uh, you know, I know this audience understands what it means to be a difficult husband. Right? As, as uh, Joan Rivers once said, how many husbands uh, go down to the corner store for a quart of milk and never come back? <laughs> Not enough. Yeah, he was that kind of husband. Uh, there weren't very many women in the regime in uh, positions of authority. Very few, in fact. Uh, that's the sort of larger patriarchal culture of Russia. Um, and Stalin loved his daughter, Svetlana, much more than his two boys and doted on her for a while. But it was very difficult for the children after the mother died. They were raised by the bodyguards, uh, the cooks, and the other staff personnel uh, at the dacha where they lived. Anyhow, so not an exemplary father, not an exemplary husband, uh, but minimal relations with women because he was a workaholic in the regime and spent almost all his time uh, building this military and the socialist modernity, this military industrial state. All right. Shall we do a couple more? Are we okay? One more? One more? All right. I have more than one in front of me. Uh, Lenin, you know, would have been better with him. Lenin had none of Stalin's charm. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. None of it. Uh, was there a realistic prospect of an Anglo-French expedition versus the USSR to aid Poland or Finland? Yeah, Anglo-French expedition. <laughs> <laughs> this audience has a sense of humor. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, uh, how did Stalin react to anti-Semitism and Mein Kampf? Do primary documents offer any insights into this? Uh, that's a good one, uh, because he's accused of being an anti-Semite. Uh, but it turns out that Stalin has no special anti-Semitism uh, that we normally associate with. He's got the, the kind of normal anti-Semitism of that time and that part of the world. Uh, let's get a good question to end on. Um, oh, my God. Okay, let's put those...